Hello, friends. Probably, in one way or another, we all love to dress well, with quality and taste. And, most importantly, practically and comfortably. We can easily list several brands whose quality and originality remain undoubtedly consistent year after year and for many decades. Of course, there is a huge array of well-known clothing brands, but among them, there is one that has managed to win the hearts of millions of people worldwide. Reserved, refined, elegant, these epithets perfectly fit this brand, and the legendary little crocodile, proudly displayed on clothing, accessories, and sports gear, rightfully deserves respect. It is this small emblem that has made Lacoste one of the most popular and recognizable brands on all continents. Today, Lacoste is not just about clothing and footwear, it also offers a vast range of accessories, watches, and, of course, perfumes. According to official statistics, the brand's perfumes are among the most sought after, especially among the male population. In 2018, the brand celebrated its 85th birthday. By that time, the company had achieved a very high level of sales and recognition worldwide. All of this is thanks to the comfort closely intertwined with high aesthetics and, of course, the enduring image of the crocodile, which, regardless of its color, is associated with a legend and a symbol of quality. But where did it all come from? Who came up with the idea of creating a brand with a crocodile? Yes, and why precisely a crocodile? Today, I will tell you about the origins of all this. It's best to start getting acquainted with the brand through its founder. René Lacoste was born in 1904 into a well-off family. His father was a highly respected figure in France, and René's future seemed predestined from his early childhood. However, René had different ideas. From a young age, he was passionately devoted to tennis, spending every free moment on the court. Until the age of 15, he pursued tennis independently and occasionally under the supervision of coaches. Day by day, he became more and more dependent on the sport. The problem was that no one believed in the young man. His physical attributes seemed inadequate for a successful sports career. He was short and not very athletic. This, coupled with his father's disapproval, led to daily quarrels about René's involvement in sports. The aristocrat father wanted his son to become a bureaucrat, not some boy with a racket. Eventually, he agreed to give René a chance, with the condition that he must become a world champion within five years. Five years may seem like a long time, but for a true athlete, it's critically short. Weeks, months of intense training, sleepless nights, and dedication, René relied on intensive preparation and only his own strength. He never completed any professional courses, had no support from his father, and could only count on himself. Perfecting his technique day by day, observing professionals' games, he learned to plan each move precisely and directly toward success. This life experience would later help him with his creation. In 1923, he received an invitation to the largest international tennis tournament in France, and by 1924, he became one of the country's most successful tennis players. Perhaps you're wondering why we need to know all this. Well, it is during this period that the foundation of the Lacoste Empire was laid. Have you ever wondered how that famous alligator came about? During one of his professional trips, while strolling through the streets of Boston, the tennis player was captivated by an expensive and extravagant accessory in a store window, a suitcase made of crocodile leather, very elegant and quite expensive. If I win, I'll definitely buy you, the young man told himself before one of the tough tournaments. He was a fierce competitor, sometimes even aggressive. Every game was like a show. He put all his strength and effort into winning. And he did it. The next day, the crocodile suitcase was no longer displayed in the store window, and the press began calling René the alligator due to his playing style. He seemed to leap across the court with daring lunges like a crocodile. A couple of days after his victory, one of René's closest friends, Robert George, an artist by profession, gifted him a drawing depicting an alligator with an open mouth. The elegant forms and finely detailed drawing captivated René. The next day, he handed over his white blazer to a tailor, where the drawing was transferred to one of the pockets. Since then, the green crocodile became René Lacoste's unique emblem. In 1927, at a tournament in the United States, René appeared in a white polo shirt tailored to his individual design, featuring three buttons and the same special alligator emblem on the chest. It's worth noting that during that time, 
tennis players only wore formal attire. The mandatory components of the outfit were a white shirt and pants. Renee's move was perceived as a protest against the main rules of the tennis tournament. However, the white polo was much more comfortable and looked impeccable against the green court. It was a challenge to traditional tennis as a sport. Many criticized him, some even wanted to ban him from playing, but he looked so cool in his outfit that soon other tennis players started copying Renee's clothing style, which he didn't particularly like. After several such situations and the immense popularity of such polo shirts among tennis players, Rene Lacoste ended his sports career. In 1933, together with knitwear magnate Andre Gillier, whom Rene happened to meet quite by chance, he founded a new clothing brand named after himself. It was from the polo shirt that the global history and success of the Lacoste brand began. But that wasn't all. For the first time in fashion history, the logo was placed not on the inner side, but on the front of the branded items, a move that many initially laughed at. However, as it turned out later, this decision was strategic and successful. Until the 1950s, Lacoste polo shirts were only available in universal white. But a bit later, Rene decided to experiment, and the first colored polo shirts appeared on the American market. It was a breakthrough. A person in a Lacoste polo seemed to acquire a special status. Rene didn't aim to flood the shelves with mass-produced items. For him, it was more like a work of art. Each individual piece of clothing had to be a symbol of quality and uniqueness. Rene didn't spend money on advertising, believing that a good and quality product didn't need it. This exclusivity made Lacoste unique. Sure, as he later recalled, I could have embroidered thousands of units a day, I could have simply cluttered the shelves of stores, but then it wouldn't have been the Lacoste I dreamed of. In the 1950s, French polo was first spotted on John F., Kennedy, and Clint Eastwood. It was a clever move by René, who came up with a smart and strategically correct move. Lacoste polo shirts were sent as gifts to the most popular personalities of that time. It was a success. Literally within a few weeks, the brand soared to the heights. Instead of spending millions on public advertising, he got by with just a couple of polo shirts. Americans saved on everything but spent their last money to buy this status symbol. Even Lacoste couldn't explain such popularity. In one interview, he said, There are things that defy explanation. Maybe if I had chosen some other cute and harmless animal for the logo, it wouldn't have worked. For example, a rooster. Everyone would know that the brand is French, but maybe there wouldn't be the same effect. However, the brand's secret lies not in the logo. Lacoste is renowned for its versatility and aesthetic appeal. The crocodile polo was so prestigious that it could be worn in any situation, from a casual stroll to a significant event. Other equally well-known brands also began modifying their logos. Take, for example, Ralph Lauren's Polo Pony or American Eagle's Eagle. Some would even further and shamelessly copied the little crocodile. Legal battles with the Chinese company Crocodile Garments lasted for a whole 10 years until the court ordered the plagiarists to change their logo. By the mid-1950s, the product range was not very extensive. In 1958, the children's clothing line was introduced. Then, in the 1960s, the world saw the introduction of leather accessories. By that time, Rene was getting older, and handling business became challenging for him. He had earned a break, a long-awaited rest. In 1963, Rene's son, Bernard Lacoste, took over the company. He had always assisted and supported his father in the family business from a young age, later making a significant contribution to the company's development. Under his leadership in the 1970s, the company ventured into the perfume industry, producing fragrances that continue to rank high in quality. In the 1980s, sunglasses and tennis shoes, leather accessories, and watches were introduced. The Lacoste brand reached its peak popularity in the 1980s when the preppy style became fashionable. Future students of prestigious U.S. colleges emphasized their status through impeccable dressing, wearing plaid pants, woolen vests with diamonds, loafers, and, of course, the legendary Lacoste polo. Bernard's main goal was to expand the range and, consequently, increase sales. In the 1990s, Lacoste polo shirts became mainstream and started being sold even in the affordable department store chain Walmart. However, the pursuit of quantity played a cruel joke. 
The product was positioned as something easily accessible and commonplace. By that time, the competition was growing rapidly, with numerous young and successful brands emerging, gradually pushing the alligator out of the market. By the end of the 1990s, the company was facing a serious crisis, with sales plummeting rapidly. It seemed like the company was slowly sinking. Bernard even considered selling the family business, but decided against it. By the joint decision of the board of directors, a new clothing line was launched. The creative director of the brand, the modern romantic Christophe Lemaire, played a significant role in lifting the brand to a new level, launching a new line primarily targeted at the youth, which eventually became a hit. Thanks to Lemaire, Lacoste clothing regained its luxury status. With the introduction of the new line, the company aimed to restore its former prestige. Alongside clothing, new fragrances for men and women were released, and several stores were opened on the most luxurious streets of New York. The Lacoste brand started sponsoring tennis tournaments, golf competitions, and supporting renowned athletes. In 1996, Russia joined the list of countries where Lacoste presented its products. The first Lacoste flagship store was opened in Moscow, gaining overwhelming popularity among the local elite from the very beginning. Comfortable clothing became incredibly fashionable, moving from tennis courts to the streets of megacities. Items with the signature crocodile logo ceased to be associated solely with sportswear, and people bought them more often than clothes from other brands. Unfortunately, in the same year, the founder of the brand, René Lacoste, passed away. However, his story and era did not end there. In 2005, due to serious illness, Bernard handed over the company to his younger brother, Michel. After some time, the reins of leadership passed to Philippe Lacoste, René's grandson. Each of them contributed something of their own to the company without changing the brand's core concept of universality and aesthetics. Today, Lacoste remains one of the few enterprises solely run by the Lacoste family. At present, the Lacoste brand is one of the most well-known and sold worldwide, with the company's products available in more than 100 countries on all continents. The average annual sales consistently exceed 50 million units of goods, and the company's own retail network has surpassed 3,000 stores. The company's headquarters remains in Paris, and all production capital is located in the French city of Troyes. In addition to the company's own factory in France, licensed production also takes place in Peru, Morocco, and Italy. Not long ago, Lacoste opened a branch in El Salvador in a free trade zone. This manufacturing facility focuses exclusively on producing goods for the U.S. The brand's history resembles a fairy tale with a genuinely bright and happy ending. René Lacoste managed to prove his love for sports to his father. In return, he received not only fame as a professional tennis player, but also the love of millions of fans worldwide. He laid the foundation for a prestigious future not only for himself, but also for his children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. Entering Lacoste stores, customers feel like they have stepped into a small style haven, experiencing aesthetic pleasure and bringing it into their everyday lives. Friends, how do you personally feel about the Crocodile brand? Have you ever bought anything from their stores? Share your impressions and reviews in the comments. It will be very interesting to read them. Well, that's all for today. Goodbye.